the economics profession, particularly the academics, have not always been as good as they might be at communicating economic ideas more broadly. So I certainly discovered at the Bank of England how difficult good communication is. My name is Mark Toma and welcome to the Royal Economic Society Conference here at the University of Manchester. I'm talking with Sir Professor Charles Bean today. Welcome. Hello. So you're, as of today, I believe, the former president of the Royal Economic uh, Society. Indeed. What is the Royal Economic Society? What does it do? It was founded 125 years ago to provide a society for economists to uh, get together a journal for economists, the Economic Journal, which of course is still publishing papers today. These days, it is the body for academic economists in the United Kingdom, but more broadly, we have a lot of uh, members scattered throughout the world. You're also the former Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy for the Bank of England. Is there any interaction between, say, the Royal Economic Society and your role as a Deputy Governor? There is a close link between the work that goes on in central banks to underpin monetary policy and uh, the maintenance of financial stability with thinking in the academic world. Plenty of uh, key central bankers like Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, who have been uh, career academics, and indeed Mervyn King, who I served under for a long time. We've seen the real interest rate, the inflation-adjusted real interest rate, declining for, for many years. So we don't think this is just due to the Great Recession. What kind of path do you see for the future for interest rates? What can policymakers do? Decline in interest rates is not just a, a post-crisis phenomenon. It's something that started happening really in the late 1990s and we've seen measures of real interest rates gradually trending down. Alan Greenspan had identified this as a conundrum, in his words, ahead of the financial crisis. Ben Bernanke had talked about it uh, in a sense of savings glut, attributing it to high savings in China. Uh, in fact, there's quite a lot of uh, possible explanations. Demographic effects as populations age. Uh, they have to save more for their retirement. There is the puzzle of exactly what's driving high savings in China. You'd expect emerging market countries to be importing savings, not exporting it. Demographics is probably part of the story there. Uh, but then there are also uh, stories to do with uh, weaknesses, investment, changes in the nature of technology, which means that production becomes less capital intensive and less need, need for funds for investment. There's also a view associated with American economist Bob Gordon that the rate of innovation may be uh, falling. And then layered on top of that, you have post-crisis uh, phenomena which have led households to save more for precautionary purposes, businesses being loath to invest because of the uncertain environment, and a general move towards uh, holding safe assets rather than riskier assets which uh, personally I think is also quite an important part of the story and that was one of the things I talked about in my lecture here. I was really surprised looking at your charts in the lecture. There's been periods in history where interest rates have been quite low for an extended period of time. Should policymakers worry about that? The most obvious period where real interest rates have been as low as they are now is the period around World War II. Uh, but mostly that was a bit different because it was a period when inflation was high and real interest rates were ah, low, gotcha. simply because inflation uh, was high and it was a period when there was a lot of controls on financial markets and so forth. The current period is rather different because it's not only low real and nominal interest rates but it's also low inflation. And that does present challenges, uh, particularly to central banks, you can't cut policy rates very much below zero. They can go a little bit negative, as we're seeing in the Eurozone. You can't take them too far because the, the banks will just switch to holding cash instead. If that repeatedly becomes a constraint, central banks have to start doing unorthodox things like quantitative easing. I think the most serious issue, though, in this environment is that a long period of very low interest rates does encourage investors to look for ways of 
ratcheting up their yield somehow. Yeah. Uh, search for yield. And search risk. for yield, so they borrow in a, a way of trying to gear up their returns. And this is exactly what we saw ahead of the financial crisis. So it is very important that central banks don't let those sorts of excesses build up again. Finally, what are some key takeaways for communicating economics to the general public? The economics profession, particularly the academics, have not always been as good as they might be at communicating economic ideas more broadly. So I certainly discovered at the Bank of England how difficult good communication is. And you do find this can get to fairly ridiculous extremes where people focus on whether a particular word, word yes. patient or not, <laughs> uh, is in the, the Monetary Policy Committee's statement. So too much information in some sense could be just as bad as too little. Indeed. The key is effective communication. Yes. And I think there's a little bit too much focus on more and more communication. Uh, but of course you can add noise. We tend to talk in jargon and the general public doesn't necessarily have that frame of reference. Above all, you have to be able to relate it to their experience. And if you don't engage them in that way, they tend to dismiss economists. I think one of the unfortunate things is people think, oh, economists should be able to predict the future. We'll never be able to do that. But we should be able to talk about the forces that are determining the outlook. Uh, in a way that the general public can understand. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks.